Welcome back to Third Phase of Moon. Blake Cousins here. Buckle up, everybody. We're going to go down the rabbit hole of the UFO history, as stated by Michael Schratt, military aerospace historian, including host Richard from Goofon, who breaks down and gets to the bottom of some of the historical cases of crash and retrieval. Buckle up and take a look at this. So this is what the craft looked like here. And it's 40 feet in diameter. It's 15 feet tall. And he said that on the lower part of this craft, there was an entry hatch, a quote unquote entry hatch. And he said that this hatch was so fully integrated into the bottom skin of this disc that you could not put a razor blade between wow here. it was so fully integrated he also said that there was a one inch lip or gap between the outer skin of the craft and the outer portion of the opaque window some type of a one inch lip there hmm. and if you look here you'll see these red dots i don't know if you can see those yeah very easily okay yep. those red dots were the attempted points of entry they actually tried to breach the hull. Oh, okay. Thing, okay. And there were these white lab coat technicians. Now, what's interesting is, and this, this Marine said that they had built scaffolding. Okay. So they propped this thing off the hangar floor, what we believe to be a hangar, about five feet. And they built scaffolding on this thing. So the whole thing was levitated off the floor. And they built a catwalk around this thing. So you could walk around the outer circumference of this thing. This and you could fantastic. walk under it. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> If you look at my blow up here, you'll see the uh, one inch lip. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you can see that, but that's sure. the one inch lip he talked about. Here are the uh, elliptical shaped windows. All right. So now what the Marine said is he said the first thing they tried to do is they used a diamond tip drill bit to breach the hull of this thing. OK, <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll flash back to here again. You can see all these little red dots. They were actually putting the diamond tip drill bit on the seam of the hatch because they thought it might be a, a lower might stress easy. area. <laughs> yeah. They tried to get in there, and that didn't work. Okay, so they, they gave up on that plan. Mm. The next plan was they were going to use an acetylene torch. So they brought a torch up to this thing. They put it on there. No effect whatsoever. Nothing. No effect. What, now I also, what, was the, what was the skin made of? The no, outside? We don't of know. <laughs> okay, we don't okay. know. Now, there was a, a U.S. Navy admiral, because his job was to stay with the disc and he was to guard the disc for a period of two weeks this is in all the uh correspondence i actually interviewed the gentleman who interviewed the marine okay. so i have him on tape he described the entire encounter hmm. uh, i have the gentleman's name i know where he lived in 86 i don't know if he's still alive um okay so there was a a white circle painted on the floor of this hangar facility and his job was to shoot to kill anyone, repeat anyone who tried to breach that circle. And mm -hmm. this admiral walked a little bit too close and he was within like two seconds of getting shot. Oh. Um, he also heard through water cooler discussions that bodies were, res uh, were involved in this retrieval as well. He doesn't okay. know where it came from, but he heard talk of bodies being associated with this. Okay, so then... After doing these two drawings, I went ahead and commissioned some full color artwork. So that's oh, what wow. you see here. Okay. You can see the scaffolding. You can see the fact that they're trying to breach the hull of it. And uh, if you look on the lower left of this illustration, and maybe we'll go to full screen here, but you'll see that there's these two electrical cords going yeah, from the outside to what you see here. Now, he also said that after they tried the acetylene torch, they brought in two, not one, but two 18-wheeler tractor trailers with these electrical generating devices sitting on the tractor trailer. Then they were feeding these cables, three-inch uh, thick gauge cables from the generating device to the inside of the hangar. They were using a laser on this thing. Wow. They were shining a laser on the bottom of the skin. When they moved it away, it was warm to the touch, but it made no effect whatsoever. <laughs> no effect whatsoever now there was one time during this two-week period that he was left alone with this craft mm. and uh within the notes that i obtained and the gentleman who interviewed this marine he said that he had a small minox camera and he took a photo of this thing cool. 
he took a photo of it. However, in 83, that photo was lost in a flood. So oh. the evidence, as you know, is always two steps ahead of us. Here, right. here we're so close. We are so close to breaking this thing. We're so close of getting the physical evidence, the, the, the evidence that we need to, to finally break it. You know, we finally got the evidence. Hmm. We do have retrievals. They are real. There's a reverse engineering program. We've got the bodies. We've, we've got all the proof, and yet it gets lost. And that's how we always end up in this field. Ufology can never get a break. They're always two steps behind. However, we do have <laughs> the original sketches from the Marine. Uh, and that's what these illustrations are based off of. Now, I just commissioned a brand new piece of artwork. Uh, I'll give credit to Jose Sanchez for doing that. Now, this, is, oh, this yeah. will be a world exclusive. This is a world exclusive. No one's ever seen this. Here, here is the uh, gentleman with the diamond tip drill pit trying oh, right to breach the hull of the craft in the hangar <laughs> up on the scaffolding. So yeah, you can see the... You the, can kind of see it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> this is Jose Sanchez. Yeah, big fan of our show here too. Yeah. yeah I've never so, seen this. This is unbelievable. Yeah, this is a world exclusive here. So <laughs> you ain't going to see this anywhere else. So that's we'll great, you with the 22-inch rims, you know. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, so that's how this thing done. Now, the, the last day that he was there, he saw that they took the craft down from the scaffolding. They were loading it in on an 18 wheeler tractor trailer. They were putting a tarp over the craft itself and then they put chains over it mm. and it was being moved to the next location. And so you can see that if this story is true, which it, I believe it to be true. If you read the wording of the original interview, this is just some, this is just some regular Marine he wasn't seeking, you know, any kind of fame. He was just calling it like he saw it. And getting back to your question, which is kind of a long way to answer this. Um, <laughs> when the gentleman that I interviewed, who interviewed the Marine, when they were talking about the the effects that this will have on the public, you know, what, what will be the actual effects? We always hear this disclosure yeah. term kicked around, like what will actually happen in the real world and here, mm -hmm. here's what this gentleman said he said that there will be a cross-section of society that will be so excited they will be thrilled they will be their mind will be blown here here we've got this truth that they've been hiding from us for 80 years it's finally coming out we've got the bodies we've got the craft we've got all the photos everything we, we've been wanting to tell you this for so long and here we're, we're finally telling you this is there'll be a cross-section of society that will be so thrilled to hear this then he said which i thought was interesting kind of like a a psychological evaluation on the public's reaction he said that there will be a a faction of society that will be furious repeat furious mm -hmm. that they are interrupting their monday night football okay with this announcement they will be absolutely furious and of course that's, that's what his thought was <laughs> some people they, they don't have a, a curious bone in their body and they could care less they could care and less that, that's amazing to me yep they could care less uh, who who did the uh the first illustrations you were showing okay i i did uh, this I, one based off the original sketch from the marine uh, and then the gentleman that I interviewed, they were sketching this as they were doing the interview. This is back in 86. So he, he allowed me to, to uh, get access to those original sketches. So I, I created this one. I created the second one. This wow. one was done by John McNeil. Okay. And then this one was done by Jose Sanchez. It's so this amazing. is just brand yeah. new here. Now, let me, I want to close the loop on this. But in order to close the loop, we have to go back in time. Okay. So this is 63. Okay. And we've always heard that Roswell was the crash retrieval. But if you go even further back, and let's take that back all the way here. Let's go to the first crash retrieval that we kind of all know about here. And let's go over here, right? So Cape Girardeau, this is April 1941. And this comes by Charlotte Mann who has a, a very, she's very well connected to this. Now her grandfather, William Hoffman, was the Baptist minister at the time. Mm -hmm. So this is April the 20th, 1941. And the uh, the minister is, it's called, you know, he's called at night, it's around 9.30 p.m. A policeman knocks on the door 
and he says uh, we have a crash of an aircraft that we believe is an aircraft would you please come and help us out we, we don't know exactly what we're dealing with here we need some assistance here so mm -hmm. he agreed he climbs into the uh, sheriff's police car they drive 15 minutes across town when they get there of course by now it's 10 o'clock and they see some smoldering flames in the background the police are on the scene there's some farm personnel there the military did not arrive yet hmm. and what he describes seeing is approximately a 30 foot diameter dish shaped craft with a dome on top it had augered in at about a 20 degree angle there was a whole breach on the side of the craft showing some of the interior components there were some uh you could say buttons and switches and levers it kind of looked mechanical um, mm. then he said that there were three bodies near the craft one was very near the entry hatch the other one was thrown out a little bit the other one was still alive and he got to the survivor about 60 seconds prior to him passing oh. okay so if anyone wants to hear more about this you can go to the mufon journal November 2001, where they interview Charlotte Mann. She talks about Reverend William Hoffman, and the whole story is brought out in this uh, in this particular document. Now, Ryan Wood interviewed her as well, so we have her testimony from Ryan Wood. So that's kind of an independent source that talks about this. Now, hmm. next illustration is Reverend William Hoffman over one of these beings. So, like literally within seconds of this particular being passing he was there but he did get there in time by this time the military got there there were fire personnel were there and they were ushering everybody out of the area they were sworn to secrecy hmm. and uh what's interesting is there were newspaper reporters that were taking snapshots of oh, this wow. <laughs> and they what they ended up doing is there were two farm hands that picked up one of these dead alien corpses they propped it up under its armpits and outstretched its arms. Oh, my God. And this gentleman snapped a photograph of this, okay? And this story was relayed via Charlotte Mann to Leonard Stringfield. Here's a photograph of Charlotte Mann. Here is kind of like a really rough sketch of how this went down. <laughs> So what I ended up doing is I took the information. Now, this isn't perfect, but we did the best we could. I took the information from Charlotte Mann. I worked with my illustrator, Tom Bogan, and we, we had known the story here from what Charlotte had told us. We, we knew that this was vintage 1941. So this photograph was handed down through the decade. She actually held this photograph in her hand multiple times. Wow. She gave a lecture at IUFOC about two years ago. She laid out the whole story. And she said, uh, you know, I did see the photograph. I held it in my hands multiple times. It was kind of handed down through uh, the decades in our family. And there was this neighbor near the original home oh, no. who was, quote, unquote, a photography analysis type. And he okay. wanted to, quote, unquote, borrow the photograph. Oh, no. You can kind of see where this is going. No. Here and she, they handed the <laughs> photograph over to this gentleman and pow the photograph disappeared of course and so this is number two now the <laughs> second time we've actually had photographs of this and it disappeared who's okay. this do-gooder come I on know, man. i know it's just, this is terrible right but it's this a long second, time ago yeah it, it's a long time ago different, however different time. all is not completely lost but oh, so yeah. that photograph disappeared so i took all the information from charlotte mann i took her original sketch all the testimony within the journal, the information from Ryan Wood, put it all together, and we pieced together a replica cool. of what this photograph might actually look like. <laughs> and uh, here is our replica. This is what the oh, photograph wow. may actually look like. The, you know, the arms were stretched out, supported under its armpits, and you know, <laughs> the, the photograph <laughs> would have been you know damaged. It might have been water yeah. damaged. It would have been faded uh wrinkled Old. torn yeah. burnt up uh <laughs> this is what it might look all these years later again it's not perfect but this is what we came up with uh based on the original testimony so now, i see that the alien's wearing that suit that we hear some of. type of a, a a yep a tight blue colored flight suit yep and we've heard that before as well yeah this tight fitting flight suit keeps popping up in these cases so uh here's the next question where could you hide three extraterrestrial bodies and a circular craft or debris 
of unknown origin in 1941. Yeah. So where where would you hide it? Mm, you'd hide it at the Pentagon, right? You'd hide it at the Pentagon. Oh, the problem wow. okay. is, in 1941, the Pentagon did not exist. So what they did, <laughs> we believe, is they hid it under the underground vault at the U.S. Capitol in Washington, wow. D.C. That's, that's where it was. That's a fact? We don't know that for oh, sure. Oh, okay, but okay. But that's, that's where, where it would have gone, yeah. Okay, now, here's the other thing, too, though. <laughs> We have the radio announcer Rush Limbaugh, okay? Sure. Most people are familiar with it. Okay, now here's the part of the story that, that gets kind of interesting, which <laughs> lends a little credibility to this. Before Rush Limbaugh became the radio announcer that almost everyone knows about, they know his name, before he was a radio announcer, he was an umpire living in Cape Girardeau, the same exact town where this all what? went down. Oh, so man. sometime in 96, a caller came in and they said, Rush, I've heard this story about, you know, something crashed. It was a UFO and they, they recovered the bodies and the craft. It was all hushed up by the military and they, they put it in glass containers and they shipped it out and it's all, it's, they're in a bunker somewhere. And is there any truth to that? And there was a pause hmm. and Rush came back and he said, there's more of that story than you know. And oh. That was the end of that. Russell, so, he looks like an umpire in a way. <laughs> that, that, that is interesting, man. Yeah. So he knows, but we never He knows found about out. this. He knew about this. He, oh. he knew about this. He definitely knew about this. Well, he lived so, there, yeah. So he probably heard a lot of things. Like, yep. like I knew about the Phoenix Lights, things that nobody else correct, heard of. Correct, correct. So, okay. So here's the, what it may have looked like in oh, the right underground on. vault at the uh now we know that there were three bodies recovered they were kept in glass containers or large glass jars oh i see them on the there right would have there. been debris there there would have been a part of the craft itself hmm. but what i really wanted to highlight here oh and we should talk about this too this came from ryan and this is a, a memo now it's a it's an interesting piece of evidence here mm -hmm. this is a, a memo from fdr president fdr to general george c marshall dated february 27th 1942. now i'm not going to read the whole thing but let's let's go over just the top part of this here it says this is president fdr talking okay i have considered the disposition of the material in possession of the army that may be of great significance toward the development of a super weapon of war. I disagree hmm. with the argument that such information should be shared with our ally, the Soviet Union. Consultation with Dr. Bush and other scientists on the issue of finding practical uses for the atomic secrets learned from study of celestial devices precludes any further discussion, and I therefore authorize Dr. Bush to proceed with the project without further delay. Hmm. Now, wow. this is back. Again, we'll go back. This is back in 42. Okay, so let's just break this down. Now, look at what he says here. He's talking about material in possession of the army. Boom. Right there, it talks about they've got hardware. They've got material. They're, they're admitting that they've got debris. At the very least, they've got some small debris. They might have a crash retrieval. And remember, wow. the 42, uh, This this would have been... This would have been 42, which is just after the 41 crash retrieval, mm -hmm. the Battle of Los Angeles. And we know oh, that yeah. at least one craft was retrieved in the Battle of Los Angeles. So that makes sense that they were talking about material in possession of the Army. By the time 42 rolled around, they already had two craft in possession. So that checks out. That completely checks out. Then they talk about the development of a super weapon of war. So it sounds like what they're trying to do is they're trying to reverse engineer the propulsion system of the of the material in possession to build a super weapon. Then they talk about look at the wording here. Yeah. Secrets learned from the study of celestial devices. Wow. Who uses that kind of wording? Who uses that kind of terminology? People who celestial have, yeah. devices? <laughs> that that can only mean one thing. That can only mean That's a it. retrieval. That's it. There it is. That's it. It's in the old, it's in the wording from President FDR. That's crazy. That's smoking yeah. gun right there, really. It's kind of a smoking gun yeah. document. Smoldering, but yeah. Th there's more, though. Th there's more because here's the second part of this story, which I, I pieced this story together, and I don't know why anybody else did. Maybe it, maybe it wasn't as obvious, but as soon as I heard <laughs> this from Charlotte Mann, I said, boy, we've got something here. Now, Charlotte Mann was 
a good friend of General Melvin McNichol. This is the Oklahoma, July 11th, 1986. Okay. So I want to document my sources. He was the base commander at Tinker Air Force Base. And he was very good friends with Charlotte Mann. They had a mutual interest in UFOs. And so Charlotte came to the general and said, you know, general, we've been friends for a long time here, many years, and we, we have this mutual interest in UFOs. You've never told me anything. You know, I'd like to I know. I mean, can you tell me something? For you're, you're a general. I mean, in regards you know, to right? this evidence, so the what's going on? Uh, again, we're not said, claiming that this is some sun simulator ever, out there, but I the repeat, possibility ever that there is technology you, that has I'll been around it. since the not 60s it, may it have come to a certain point in our time right now that has been implemented. This is what he said. This is, again, all speculation. But the evidence in regards to the similarities, in my opinion, what these and documents compared to West. what the video okay. shows is he also said kind of undeniable. Guys, I want to get your thoughts in the comments below. I appreciate this thing. They you guys joining us in this special episode right here at Third Phase of Moon. Keep your eyes in the skies, That's everybody. Amazing. Virtually yes. identical we'll see to what the Marines said in 1963. <laughs> he yeah. said that they had propped this thing up on scaffolding. He said they built a catwalk around this. And he heard through... Uh, water cooler talk about bodies being recovered this is exactly what melvin mcnichol had said so is it Boom. real or is it just that is this a made-up story that they're no it's it's not a made-up story the one in 63 two, i mean yeah it, we, we've got two independent sources That's that unreal. don't know anyone who are coming forward with the same information and when i heard that from <laughs> from Charlotte Mann that this general said that they built oh, cool. scaffolding and propped this thing up. I go, oh boy, oh boy, That's we, so got cool. it. we got it now, we got it, we're there. You See, know? this is what I love about ufology, <laughs> this stuff. That's corroborating without corroborating. It's, it's uh, corroborating, I mean, it's yeah. corroborating. I mean, here, this guy said it was located in the <laughs> West. Okay, if you if you take off on a plane and you fly three hours from Cherry Point, North Carolina. That oh. puts you within the range of the West. It does. Nevada. It does. Yeah. That checks out. <laughs> and and when, when do you hear about UFOs being propped up on scaffolding? Never. How would this guy know this? How yeah. would he know this? The Marines said the same thing. He said the same thing. Now, here's where it gets interesting. <laughs> here's right. my okay. question. What did President Kennedy know about UFOs? Mm -hmm. When did he know it and who did he tell? That's what we need to know. That's what we need to find out. You that know, is uh, did, the other. Did he tell Marilyn Monroe between the sheets? You That's know he did. We, uh, you know we did. You know he did. Of course, <laughs> did. Of course. Of course he did. Always trying to impress. That, that's amazing. Yeah, and, and uh, what did he know? A lot of people think that's one of the reasons he was, you know, executed. Who knows? Anyway, yeah, yeah. But... but uh, that's I, now I see why you went back to that one. Yes, yeah, see, yeah, there, there's a tie-in. You know, all this stuff is connected. There's always a tie-in to this. And since we're on the roll of these crash retrievals, let, let's just keep on going down the road here. So, oh, I love this it, yeah. story. The Jackie Gleason story is like just about my favorite yeah. legend when you follow. <laughs> it's never been proven conclusively. We don't have hard evidence. We we've got some tangential evidence that we'll talk about here, but. Okay. It's just one of these legendary stories within ufology. So let's kick this off. So sure. it's Homestead Air Force Base. It's February 19th, 1973. Now, the first part of this story is 100% true. And I can prove it. No, no problem at all. Okay. I can prove it. No problem. So this is Jackie Gleason, President Richard Nixon at the Charity Golf Course outing. This is Florida, February 1973. They they did get together. Here's yeah. here's Jackie Gleason. You can see the president here. They actually did get together. And uh, <clears throat> as the story goes, the subject of UFOs came up around the ninth hole. <laughs> and uh, Jackie Gleason turns to the president. And I will state up front that... Jackie Gleason was a huge paranormal fan. Mm -hmm. I mean, like huge. The guy was totally into UFOs, the paranormal. He had a huge library. Big His time. home was called the Mothership. It was built in the shape of a UFO. It still exists today. <laughs> you can go actually go see Jackie Gleason's home, and it looks like a UFO. Cool. The, the guy was 100% into it. So <laughs> he turns to the President Nixon, and he says, you know, Mr. President, I have this huge interest in ufos i've been wanting to know this whole my whole life i've had this huge interest what can you tell me can mm -hmm. you tell me anything 
So the president turns to Jackie Gleason's and he, and he says, you know, well, you know, Jackie, if you'll be available later this evening, I might be able to help you with that. So they finish up their golf outing and <laughs> Jackie didn't think too much of it. He goes, he goes back home and somewhere around 1130 at night, there's a knock on the door. So Jackie gets up, he opens the door and it's Richard Nixon standing in the doorway it's the president he's all alone no secret service he drove his own car and there's been some conflicting reports all oh, the president they, they don't do that they don't sneak away apparently richard nixon had a history of doing this so right he loved anyway, to drive i heard yep he he shows up at jackie gleason's house on you know alone mm -hmm. and he says uh jackie you know what we were talking about on the golf course this afternoon and he said yeah i i do i remember he says, why don't you come follow me? So oh. Jackie Gleason gets in the passenger side of Richard Nixon's car. They drive from the house of Jackie Gleason, which he was living in Miami or Inverary at the time. And they drive to Homestead Air Force Base. They get to the far side of the base where they have the entry gate, the security gate. And the security guard is shocked, right? It's the president. It's the president. <laughs> And Jackie Gleason, the famous actor, is sitting on the passenger. He can't believe it. So he waves the president through. They drive to the far end of Homestead Air Force Base. And they are met with a escort. And the escort brings both the president and Jackie Gleason into this facility. And I want to take you inside the facility now and to show you what they saw. Okay. Yep. What they ended up seeing are at least six repeat six vintage coke freezers okay if you if you've ever known these coke freezers but that's what they saw and so here's what we're going to do we're going to go in here this is what they saw these oh, coke those, freezers yeah. okay there were six of them there and now i'm taking you in the hangar there were the <laughs> remains of these childlike mangled and burnt quote unquote extraterrestrial bodies that were small statured about three feet they look like children yeah. in the background there were these blue bins and then debris within the blue bins believed to have been the debris from this crash retrieval i don't know the timeline okay. this could have been kingman this could have been aztec i don't know could have been 53 48 time frame he never he never found out yep. so here's jackie gleason he's looking within these things I mean, he's shocked to his core. We'll go ahead and we'll advance here. Here's Jackie Gleason looking inside the Coke freezer. And he can't believe what he's seeing. <laughs> you know, wouldn't you love to be on the trip home that night wondering what was going through Jackie Gleason's mind? My God. So it's now after 12 midnight, uh, obviously, the president brings Jackie Gleason back home. And according to Jackie Gleason's ex-wife, Beverly McKittrick, because she didn't know where he went this guy disappeared where did yeah. he go for an, an hour or so he when he got back home he plopped down on, on the couch and he was a changed man from that point forward he was never the same after that he was a completely changed yeah. man all right so what evidence at all do we have to prove any of this is this just like this legend in ufology or do we have any proof of any mm. of this okay so I started digging, right? I started digging. Okay. Here's what I came up with. Fort Lauderdale News, February 1st, 1973. Florida's most star-studded sport event, Super Golf with Superstars. So here's the advertisement for this Inverary Golf outing. It actually did take place. Here's the blow okay. up here. 1973, Jackie Gleason, Inverary National Airlines Classic, February 19th through the 25th. So the dates check out there was such an event so he was there with the president mm. that all checks out like Here's why would anybody make up that story though just because well, jackie gleason had an interest in it make up all this it sounds pretty good i, I know it sounds good and there's other reasons to believe it too oh and okay i'm gonna i'm gonna talk about that as well but here's the tampa tribune february 20th 1973 president nixon and host Gleason smiling in the rain. They rode entertainers golf cart around Inverary course. So we, we know that the event did take place. What yeah. we wanna know is, did the second part of it take place? Okay, so Miami Herald, February 20th, 1973. Here's the president talking uh, during the event. So 
we, we've proven that he was there. They were both together on that day. So let's talk about the timing, right? Yep. I did a map, a Google map from Miami, Florida to Homestead Air Force Base is 38 minutes. It's 28.8 miles. My question is, could the president have picked up Jackie Gleason in Miami? Could they have driven to Homestead Air Force Base? Could they have viewed the bodies and the debris and then drove him back? like relatively quickly of course. could they have pulled it off could they have pulled it off now you know it would have been late so <laughs> it would have been like 11 or 12 midnight so this is back in 1973 in 2021 they said it's a 38 minute drive back in 73 at 12 midnight there would have been nobody on the road right. at that time so you can easily shave off 8 minutes right there so now we got a 30 minute drive so that's 30 minutes there Let's say they spent 10 minutes at this facility. That, that's a very conservative wow, number. Wow, yeah, minutes that is. There, and then 30 minutes back, they could have done it in just over an hour. Yeah. It's feasible. Anywhere, yeah, for sure. It's feasible. It could have been done. And nobody would have known. I mean, they could have pulled it off. Okay, so. Man. Here's another one. Dayton Daily News, May 14th, 1993. Jackie Gleason claimed that Richard Nixon took him to Homestead Air Force Base and he viewed alien bodies. That's <laughs> written about in a book here, and it isn't just Jackie Gleason. Okay, next one. William Shatner? Yeah, yeah, something else. Mm -hmm. William Shatner experienced Yikes. something okay. strange out in the desert, but he won't say what Got it is. It. Okay. okay. The, the Times Tribune, July 5th, 1987. Here's the key part of this. In her unpublished biography of the funny man entitled The Great One, Beverly Gleason's second spouse or Gleason's second spouse described a bizarre trip Jackie took with then president in 1973 to Homestead Air Force Base in Florida to see what she says were the bodies of four dead space aliens recovered by the Air Force. Okay, so she had a manuscript titled The Great One. It was never published though. Oh. That's the thing. So if we could get a copy of this manuscript, it wouldn't be bombshell conclusive evidence that this took place, but it would be another piece of the puzzle yeah. to add to what we already know. So that's interesting. Okay, that's here's unbelievable. Here. <laughs> that's crazy. Larry W. Bryant, who is director of the organization, because he had Operation Right to Know, he had this organization. Larry W. Bryant, who is the director of the organization, wrote back that there have been reports that McDill Air Force Base in Tampa, near you, yeah. Langley Air Force Base in Virginia, and Homestead Air Force Base near Miami have all served as way stations or temporary repositories for crash saucer artifacts. Wow. Boom right there that's now, unreal yeah the other part of this is uh, 10 years ago well it's more like 15 years ago now i was in contact with a retired u.s navy combat veteran his name was jack d pickett he claims that in 1967 he saw at least four u.s jet flying wing disc aircraft at mcdill air force base and he said that they had a library there oh. where they had gun camera footage photographs eight by ten color eight by ten glossy black and white the wow. film reels everything we would need to move this whole field forward and here in this tampa tribune article they're talking about McDill as being one of these repositories right. for this information. That checks out. I knew Jack Pickett personally. I interviewed him. I knew the man personally. He talked about McDill being one of these places. It checks out. It checks out. It's so wild. here we, we can yeah. see we're building the case from multiple different uh, reference points for sure. And 36 years. Um, yeah, I mean, it's almost 37 years ago. It just flew by. I mean, yeah. it's, and that's what scares me. It's like we're still flying by and nothing is progressing as much as we would like it. But uh, exactly. exactly. I guess, yeah, we'll continue here. Yeah, we, we need to. We just need to. What is it going to take? Let me get your impression. What do you think it's going to take to push this through? It will. It will have to be either. It, it won't be the our government. Uh, I think it will have to come from the people or another country or an alien or a ship landing somewhere 
and a lot of people seeing it or something is spotted out in orbit. I, I think that's what it would take. And then they mm-hmm. broadcast it somehow or somehow it gets on TV and it would have to be something like that without being too threatening. Maybe just one craft. I don't know. Hmm. There's so many different ways we can go about it, right? Right, right. <sighs> but I think this is... Yep. Go ahead. It's going to take the physical evidence. Nothing short of the physical evidence is going to push this through because that's what the scientific scientific community will demand and it's what the public will demand. They're going to want to see the actual hardware. And they don't. It's they don't nothing care about less it. than. Yeah. You know, you think they care about what we think, the public? I I, I think um, they just proved they didn't. In, in a sense, I do. In a sense, I don't. And I don't. I, I agree with the Marine. He said that he knew that there would be a, a portion of society that would just be upset that their I Love Lucy reruns would be interrupted. I know. Or their Monday night foot- football would be interrupted. And, and I agree with him. Some people just don't care. You know? Yeah, but I don't think that's the majority anyway. I don't I think, think it's the majority, no. Mm-mm. But we, we don't really care about th- Those people will come around once the uh, evidence is proven. Um, but you keep saying something. You've said it a couple of times. This is just another piece to the puzzle, another, mm-hmm. you know. So that's what we're doing until we get an... I mean, there's so much evidence, you can't deny it. But uh, I always go back to abductions, and I know they're going to stay away from that. Uh, you said there's not that many cases you have uh, on abductions. But for me, that that seems to sell it to me every time. Hmm, really? Okay. Do, do you okay. not feel that? Do you think abductions are something in the mind when we go to sleep or just a, something with the brain? So do you focus in on modern cases or pre-internet all cases, pre-all of them? Okay. Yeah, I okay. try to. Yeah, I'm familiar with, you know, of course, the Betty Barney Hill and others like that. So, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, um, but those have been proven to be not so truthful, too. There's been a lot yeah. of holes in the stories, you know, that Betty know. and Barney Hill. You know. So, yeah, it's a shame. But there's millions of people who claim it. And I not know. not people who would come out, uh, you know, you would think, you know, that would want to put their career on the line. Those type of people. Every, yeah. every type. You're right. You're right. Um, but that's the thing. How do we prove the abductions? How do we prove the crash retrievals? Can't. Yeah. That's the thing. That's yeah. how it is with everything, though. Except, That's right. you know, and, and what you have here is nice. The illustrations really uh, sharpen what I'm trying to imagine. You know, it mm-hmm. looks great. Uh, I'd like to see more of those. Uh, but you have a huge book of all these stories, right? Like hundreds. Sure. How sure. many do you have? Uh, well, with I've illustrations, three hundred three hundred three ring binders. Now they're not all what? historical cases, but yeah, uh huh, yep. Oh, yep. I didn't know it was Pertaining that much. Pertaining to all this stuff. Oh, yeah, we've only scratched the surface. we got enough here to continue on to the next Ice Age. Let's hope, Michael, that we don't have to wait for another Ice Age, as you just said, for disclosure. i got a feeling it could be sooner than later, but we're trying to find out. We're all in this together. Appreciate Richard from Goofon for his incredible interview with Michael Schrat to see the second hour of this episode. Go visit them. The link is in the description. There's a lot more to this interview, so I urge you to go check out Goofon's channel. Everybody, keep your eyes on the skies. Be safe. Blake Cousins, we'll see you next time. Let's just go down the rabbit hole here for a second. Let's just assume this is some sort of adversarial or foreign technology. Most of the more than 120 incidents over the past two decades are not from the U.S. military or other advanced U.S. government technology. It's right in front of me, it just disappears. Disappears, disappears, like gone. They clear he's referring to this giant object as a, as a tic-tac instead of a shape like one.
you're in, that we don't know what these things are, and they might even be extraterrestrial, that's worse.